The eighth chapter begins with the words, and God remembered Noah. Let me tell you this, God never forgot him. (laughs) It is important that we realize that in the Bible, there are terms that are used for God that are anthropomorphic type terms. In other words, describing God in human language. Really, it's impossible to do but we don't have anything else. We don't have the divine terms to describe God's divine character. Thus, we must define or describe God's actions and God's character in all that we have, human language. But there's no way that human language can really portray the truth of God. And so we just have to do the best we can using terms that are familiar with us to describe the activities or the actions of God because we really don't have any other terms. Paul, when he was caught up into heaven, said, I I heard things that would be unlawful for me to try to describe. In other words, there isn't language that can do it justice. Anything I would try to describe would be so much less than what it actually was. It'd just be a crime. I'm not going to even try and describe it because it'd be a crime to try to reduce it to human language. Now, we do oftentimes experience the weakness of human language. Looking at the surf at Waikiki, it's How do you describe it? Looking at an Arizona sunset. Looking at the Grand Canyon. Looking at the marvels of God's creation. We're bound with human language, but oh my! How beggarly it is to adequately describe the glory, the beauty, the sensation that you feel within. And so we have to do our best with what we've got. And so God remembered Noah. Not that He ever forgot Noah. But now the activity of God with Noah picks up again. So that God was really watching over that ark for all of those days that it was floating there upon the waters. God remembered Noah, began His activity with Noah once more, and every living thing and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. And so, for the first time, probably, there began the strong wind currents. Prior to the flood, with all of the water suspended in the atmosphere, there was much less water surface upon the earth at that time. Uh, The earth was probably, as a result, far more uh, jungle-like everywhere. There wouldn't have been the arid desert regions. Uh, There uh, would have been a a more of an earth-water kind of a balance and would have meant that there would have been uh, actually a much greener effect. This water suspended in the atmosphere kept a moderate climate around the world. There weren't ice caps at the polar regions. In fact, the polar regions were uh, jungles also. But uh, now that this moisture blanket has been removed and there is not nearly the amount of moisture in the atmosphere as there was prior to the flood, there was the beginning then of the ice caps and the beginning of the glacial movements. And with the development now of the ice caps at the polar regions and the hot zone of the equator, you have then the makings for these wind currents that began. And so God caused a strong wind. Now winds can 
uh, be developed by the heat and the cold areas. The contrast between them, something that didn't exist before the flood. Prior to the flood, there weren't really violent wind storms at all. There could not have been. The, the climate was uh, moderated to the extent that any breeze at all would have been just a very gentle breeze and air movement, but not um, great violent winds. But now the wind blowing and the water receding, uh, actually draining off into ocean beds. Now, as it was doing this, the earth, as the pressure of the water began to settle in the lower areas, the, the seabeds, uh, the uh, crust of the earth began then to have tremendous pressures and there were these great uplift movements. So Mount Everest and the Himalayas began to push upwards. The Andes began to push upwards and there is evidence of this movement uh, there in the mountain ranges of this upward thrust as uh, there were these tremendous pressures being created by the weight of the oceans settling in some areas and pushing and thrusting upwards. Uh, great volcanic action, uh, volcanic action around the world at this particular time the development of the mountain ranges, the establishing of the seas in their present order, and of course the, the dramatic uh, geographical changes that took place then after the flood. So while Noah was uh, there sitting atop Mount Ararat, there were all kinds of activities that were taking place in the uh, geographical surface of the earth around him as you have... Uh, the settling of the seas and the upward thrust of the mountains. Again, um, I might suggest the little book Earth in Upheaval by Emmanuel Velikovsky where he thoroughly documents the upward thrust of the Andes as having taken place about five to 6,000 years ago. Where he documents the upward thrust of the Himalayas taking place about the same time as the Andes were going upwards. And his, his book is an excellent documentary of the upward thrust of the mountain ranges within historic time. And so you might find that very interesting indeed. We have uh, found in the Andes the remains of cities that are now high up in the Andes where the people grew corn and so forth in areas that are far above the level of growing corn. Uh, and the indication is that the people were living at a lower altitude, but with this upward thrust. They were thrust so high in this upward thrust that no longer could they cultivate and, and uh, develop the... Uh, uh, area in the same type of agriculture and they finally just left the area and, and moved to lower climates. And uh, there's plenty of evidence uh, for these things and this are part of the upheaval of the earth after the flood period. The fountains also of the deep and of the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. And so the the deluge is over and now drying out time and the waters return from off the earth continually and after the end of the 150th days the waters were abated and the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. The mountains of Ararat are the highest mountains in that region. They go up to 17,000 feet which means that they are higher than anything in the continental United States uh, except for McKinley up in the area of Alaska. Now, here is another interesting thing. Noah went into the ark on the 17th day of the second month 
And now it is the seventh month and also again the seventeenth day when the ark rested as though it had been laboring in this great ocean, the flood. Now it is settled and resting. It is believed that the ark has been discovered. There are several books on the subject at about the 14,000 foot level at Mount Ararat. There have been a lot of stories concerning it dating back historically to the time of well, even before Marco Polo, but Marco Polo does also mention it in his writings. But the interesting thing is that five months equaling 150 days shows that originally the year was calculated at 360 days a year, 12 30-day months. And in all of the ancient type records and calculations, they all calculated the year at a 360 day year. Now, of course, we in our modern calculations know that the earth revolves around the sun every 365 days. Nine hours, 56 minutes and four Six one hundredths of a second, I think, is what it's supposed to be. Or nine and six one hundredths of a second. And it's right on time. Every time it makes its orbit, it's, it's, you know, you can set your watch to it. Now, this five and a quarter days in just ten years would throw your seasons completely out of kilter. So they could not have made a mistake of five and a quarter days in their calculation of the earth's rotation or else their whole seasons would have been out in just a few years' time. So in calculating the year at 360 days, they were probably accurate in their calculation. That was probably the length of the earth's orbit around the sun in those days. But the change of the earth's orbit around the sun was probably about the time of Joshua when, as the Scripture recorded, God caused the sun to stand still. And from that time, historically, the calendars began to change and they began to calculate the year at 365 days, putting in their leap years. Some of the nations adjusted in other ways for a while, but ultimately all of the calendars began to move towards the 365-day year. Some would adjust for a holiday at the end. They still calculated the 30-day years and then put a little holiday at the end of no time uh, while they were waiting for these five and a quarter days to catch up. But it is interesting that biblical prophecy is predicated on the original 360-day year. Again, Emmanuel Vilikovsky in his book, Worlds in Collision, thoroughly documents the 360-day year in the Egyptian, Indian, Chinese records, Babylonian, of course, it's Babylonian calendar carried on a 360 day year for a long time. The Incas. But there has been that change of the Earth's orbit, and of course, it is his theory that the change was wrought through the introduction of the planet Venus into our solar system, and he accounts that uh, for the plagues of Egypt. And then later on when it returned again uh, and, and was then caught in its own orbit around the sun that it created a change in the earth's orbit at that time. And that there were great uh, 
happenings upon the earth, Joshua describes how God threw rocks from heaven at their enemy and he believes that that was caused by uh, debris from the planet Venus uh, that was uh, uh, scattered upon the earth and he believes that the long day was uh, actually uh, caused by this near approach to Venus and he has a very interesting theory that has come into recent attention again uh, by the scientific world. But here in Genesis, five months, 150 days. So the years were calculated at this time at a 360 day year. And as I say, all prophecy in the Bible is predicated on that 360 day year, uh, which uh, is interesting because uh, that really puts us out to just about the year 6,000 at the present time. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. And in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. So the water is now draining off there beginning to settle in the, in the seabeds and of course there begins this upward thrust of the mountainous regions and the tops of the mountains are now beginning uh, to come into view above the water by the tenth month. And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. So he sent forth a dove to see if the waters were abated from the face of the earth. And the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth, and then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled, it, uh, pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet or waited another seven days. And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came to him in the evening. And lo, in her mouth there was an olive leaf that was plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. So it came to pass in the 601st year, that would be the 601st year of Noah's life. He entered in the ark in the 600th year of his life. And so this would be the 601st year of Noah's life. In the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. But still he did not come out, for in the second month on the seventh